Well, hello, everybody. We are here today with Richard Polt of Xavier University and more besides for that. Um, and we're going to be talking about Henri Bergson uh, or Bergson or however you wish to say his name. Bergson, I believe. So. Bergson used to be a very celebrated thinker in uh, the early to mid 20th century. And he sort of receded from the popular imagination, despite something of a, of a recent renaissance. Uh, and there are various ideas circulating as to why um, he receded in significance. But it, uh, he's still remembered for being one of the few philosophers to have really put time as a, as, as a central consideration in his accounting of the world. And how is that relevant to our current impasse? It's part of what we're going to talk about here with Dr. Um, Polt today. Um, part of it is relevant because of, and I was thinking about this a little bit, I know what you think about this, right? He had this uh, debate uh, with Albert Einstein around relativity, which offers a differential accounting of time than that which is espoused by Bergson, but it's not just about time, it's about subjectivity. And they're very, that's sort of perennially significant, but where I think it becomes uh, more salient for our junction is a potential intersection with the digital, because I feel like the digital is trying to forward a particular sense of time or temporality, which I would say is even beneath the, what you find in an Einsteinian narrative, its linearity is, I think, uh, it's not even, it's, it, it's claustrophobic. But um, I think that Bergson's accounting of time might be an antidote to that tendency or that trajectory. And, and maybe we could open with that. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I'd like to hear more about what you think uh, digital technology is doing to time or to our sense of time. Well, for one thing, it, it fragments our sense of time radically. Um, it's, it's it's kind of obvious how it does that spatially and vis-a-vis -vis presence, right? In some respects, you can see this anticipated by Walter Benjamin in his essay, which antedates the digital per se, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, where the capacity to take a particular piece of art and reproduce it ad infinitum, actually then pragmatically, if not metaphysically, decenters the work from its uh, situatedness, if you like, at a particular point in time. All of a sudden, and, and, and it trivializes the significance of the, of the root or the er work or whatnot, right? So now there's not one Mona Lisa, there's thousands and millions of Mona Lisas, right? So then, oh, as this, proceeds apace, the uh, significance of the original piece is greatly devalued, right? And then by implication, so are the circumstances of place and history, which inform the creation and the idiosyncrasy, the uniqueness of that particular work, whatever that work may be. So already with mechanical reproduction, you see a tendency that trivializes the historical. And the digital radicalizes this development. It takes it to several other levels of uh, uh, destruction. So what is the implication for our sense of time? I, I feel that we sort of sit, now we're, um, and I think so just, I'm just sort of talking through this even now as we talk. Uh, I'm thinking when we like phenomenologically, if you like look at what happens when you, you know, allow yourself to be sort of drawn into your device for usually for relatively trivial reasons, whether that be a game or an email or surfing or things like that. And it's not just the phones. The phones are useful as a rhetorical set piece because they exemplify a phenomenon which I think extends just beyond our interaction with the phone. Um, 
uh, you lose your sense of time. You're not in the same way, I think, that you do, say, when you like, get lost in a book, okay? Because what happens when you get lost in a book or a piece of art or film or in a conversation, there's this thematic unity that connects and in here maybe this notion of uh, duration can be brought to bear from Bergson which connects the experience in its unfolding whereas speaking personally digital technologies erase our sense of time as experience but they also introduce to it was my field of subjectivity a sense of fragmentation and, and uh, part of that has to do with the interface. What is the, the, the implication for time? Well, I don't want to complicate things overly, but I think we could introduce another term here, the term of identity, where that sense of fragmentation begins to creep in and compromise our sense of who we are in various ways and then we arrive at the surprising suggestion that our relationship with time and history is integral to realizing who and what we are and this sort of injury which is being done to that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the digital I think is is, is grievous and, and uh, to be resisted. I will add one more thing because I've been talking quite a bit here. And um, I, said, I think what happens with the digital is that it demands you in order to, and this is kind of a technical point, but I think it might have broader implications. For, for technology to be digital, you have to take your source material and you have to reformat it to make it amenable to the digital relay to make it amenable to binary articulation. And this, I think, is actually not trivial. It, it means that you are no longer respecting the continuity of whatever it is you're reformatting, continuity in a deep sense. For it, for it to be formatted digitally, the nature of the technology, you have to destructure whatever it is that you're trying to reformat. And some people might say that this, I'm being a little academic and I'm splitting a hair here, but I think that there's something subtly and deeply destructive about that process um, as well, which potentially informs what we're discussing here. I think that's all very well stated. And I think I would agree with it hundred um, <laughs> percent. Another thinker who's helped me think about digital technology and temporality is Carl Schmitt, who's most notorious for his theory of politics as being about the friend-enemy relation and for his right-wing, in fact, Nazi affiliations. But there's a, a youthful piece by him written over 100 years ago, a satirical piece called The Bury Bunks. And I recently published something about that. So it's a sort of science fiction where he imagines that everybody in society is expected to keep these very detailed diaries which they publish and everybody else has access to everything they do which should sound familiar right this has come true <laughs> in the 21st century so we're all just hyper bure bunks now and uh, he calls it an essay in the philosophy of history because what they are basically is historians everybody's been turned into a historian of their own lives and of everybody else's and the entire culture has been reoriented so that the point of it is to store up these representations of the past right to, to store up this treasure trove of representations right. uh and it's very elaborate and very ingenious but what he says about temporality is that each moment becomes what he calls a rat second you're waiting for a rat to emerge from the dark hole of the future pop into the present and then be sucked into the past where it's trapped right so you're developing this huge pile of dead rat carcasses of the past which is what we do you know when we scroll through social media or something which as you say is fragmented is always something new and different and we don't dwell on any of it it's all really it feels like we're in the present but we're really in the past right we're looking at representations of the recent or not so recent past 
and we're putting into this storehouse stockpile of digital representations, which can then, at least we assume, be accessed immediately, no matter how we want. We can pick it out, reuse it, adapt it. And it really does mess with our sense of time and our sense of self. So um, so I think what you've said is very apt and it does relate to Bergson because um, he's very concerned with recovering the self. Um, so way before digital technology and even before modern mechanical technology, I think time has been associated with the dispersal of the self, the loss of the self, uh, strewing the self. Um, St. Augustine, when he's writing about time, says, my life is ripped apart. It's distended in time. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to pull yourself together and recollect, remember, as opposed to dismember and, and gather yourself together. I think a, a word remember when you really listen to it is always helpful. You're remembering, you're putting it back together into an integrity. Um, the other thing about Bergson there is his sense of the past is very much alive. It's not just an archive. Um, it, there's a sense that of, of an organic relationship, which isn't even strictly, I think, linear. You could say that there's a sense that for Bergson, all three dimensions of the past interrelate in an integral way. This, you know, that the future actually informs the past and, and vice versa, right? You know, um, it's not, so it's not, it's not static, right? So, and, and the, the word organic is useful here, right? Because what's happening is our sense of time is uh, both uh, very austerely linear, but also segmented. There's a moment and 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 a moment. And, a moment. and the moments do not, strictly speaking, in our account, have a relationship one to the other. The, the, the sense of causal interplay is uh, not effaced, but greatly diminished, which might actually connect back to the issue of the digital, because if you think about it, digital formatting, you basically, or if you just like, you know, it's like the cells in a film, which is in a digital technology per se, but that segmented sense of time, strictly speaking, the cell, the, the relationship between the cells in a film, the frames of a film is accidental, right? They just happen to be, we're tempted to see it this way. They just happen to be sequenced in this fashion, but there's no reason that they have to be sequenced in that fashion. They can be sequenced in a different fashion. And um, I use film as an example, but which is pre-digital, but it's still useful to see what happens with the digital formatting of history where you could almost think uh, you could edit history okay <laughs> you know there's no longer a relationship a, a deep relationship uh, amongst the, the moments on the time on the on the quote-unquote timeline right um they they just are accidentally related to each other in uh, a disclosure um but there's nothing about the being of the moment which prevents it from being situated in a different relationship to other moments. And this, of course, the question is, how could Bergson act as a counterpoint to that temptation? Um, it's kind well, of- There's also, there's another temptation too. I think there that in maybe both in common sense and in philosophy, we tend to oscillate between two extremes. So one would be what you're describing where time just splits apart into these sort of chrono atoms that are unrelated and can be scrambled around and there is no unity but the other is the tendency to see everything as deterministic right and as a sort of um overwhelming necessity and and if you do that then life becomes meaningless in a different way right so you need something in between and i think he um he holds out the hope that he can he can give us some, what we want um, by, I mean, the word organic is good, right? He looks to life as his model. Um, most famously in creative evolution, he looks at the evolution of life forms as ongoing. It's, it doesn't have a telos, he says. It's, it's not all for the sake of fulfilling one pre-established end, because that's a sort of determinism. And it's, all, and it's not all mechanistic either, according to him. But if there's this, this so-called elan vital, this, this vital 
force or energy or, or spirit that sort of surges out and you don't know where it's going but you're part of it uh, and it's happening and it's alive and it's meaningful so there's a a growing unity there a unity in the making well i think what's exciting about that is it's um it's not making this concession to the kind of a cat catas catastrophic sort of uh, apocalyptic narratives to which we seem to be increasingly drawn as a culture that they, okay well it's all well, you can see this with like neonatalism i'm mean, not uh, anti-natalism and things like that where it's like well it's all over we're just going to spin out until the sun you know swallows us or we end up you know destroying all viable earth except for the cockroaches and things like that it's all very gloomy but it's also i think dishonest to our actual experience of life which i think tracks more consistently with what bergson is talking about that there's like the openness to it um i really didn't get much to creative evolution so i was surprised when you're saying how he actually discounts the notion of telos or teleology um but Maybe you could say more about that, like where his position is there. Well, if, I mean, the most famous teleological thinker is Aristotle, right? For him, the whole universe is teleological, uh, and certainly living things are. And so the philosopher can look at examples of humans, let's say, although they're the, the toughest case, but, but still he thinks we can look at examples of humans, we can generalize and we can say, here's the human telos, we're supposed to be this way, uh, this is what it means to be a fulfilled human being. And that's the nature of things. Um, he doesn't, he actually briefly discusses evolution. So Empedocles came up with the theory of evolution, very crude idea of natural variation, survival of the fittest. And Aristotle says, well, that's nonsense. We know, you know, nature doesn't happen randomly. Nature happens regularly. And that means there's a, there's a goal. Um, so he kind of dismisses that very quickly. Um, and the Bergson's problem with it is that that is, it's too closed. It's too determined it's there's no real growth there's no real development or, or evolution there so um you know he is in a general way a follower of darwin he's not darwinist strictly speaking but he's part of that whole uh those generations from the 19th and early 20th century that were deeply influenced by the idea that new forms really can arise new ways of being new ways of living new kinds of uh things so he's trying to do justice to that Yes, but I think, uh, well, I just, I, you know, so. so maybe we could talk a bit more about memory as well, which might seem yeah. like I'm just interposing here arbitrarily, but I think memory is part of the equation and his sure. particular account of memory, which strikes me as tied to how he accounts for subjectivity. Could you elaborate upon that for a moment? So I'm I'm not a Bergson expert, I have to say, and I'm and I actually confess I haven't read Matter and Memory, so I can't say a lot about it. But except from my other readings in Bergson, um, it's it's the capacity. So here to back up a second, there's a puzzle for me, and I think for others in understanding Bergson is that in a number of writings he tends to be dualistic, almost Cartesian in a way about. The difference between subjective experience and the objective world like in the objective world there is no past because he says because it's gone it doesn't exist anymore the past exists only in our memory only in the, the continuity that we can create thanks to our experience of duration between past and present but then in creative evolution he's got this cosmic view in which of course the universe has a past the entire universe is this sort of one big swell, this one big wave of which we are a part. So how to how to make those two views coherent? I'm not sure. I, my view is probably that that creative evolution is a more speculative text, and in the others he is sort of sticking to what um, the title of his dissertation called the the immediate data of consciousness. Uh, in any case, human memory. Somehow, he doesn't explain exactly how, but human memory has this ability to form these links uh, between 
the present and past, right? To to hold on to the past and get this deep connection to this this swell of events, the swell of time of which um, the current moment is only sort of the cutting edge. On that point of dualism, right, uh, what I just struck me is how he's really, in my incipient reading of him, almost directly uh, giving an homage to Descartes because he creates in his language this distinction between extensivity and intensivity. And of course, in Descartes, what you have is the race mensa and the race extensa, uh, Latin, right? But there's that word extension. I think what uh, Bergson is trying to do is, is, is through the notion of creating this category of intensivity. This is a challenge of Bergson as he furnishes these neologisms. And you can, when you read him, you can say, oh, I see what you mean there, but it's just very slippery, very slippery. And uh, it strikes me that what he's trying to do is exhibit how uh, mental life is inappropriately discussed in vocabulary that was born to deal with race extensa or extensivity, right? That is, in a way, he's somewhat like this sort of bizarro Wittgenstein, is that good, right? So where you have this notion that you're playing the wrong language game, all right? Through the motif of linguistic spatialization. So as long as you continue to spatialize metaphorically, and yes, in a, to a degree that's almost inevitable because language has kind of its own limitations, you're missing the actual quality of your encounter with life, where it does not, it's not actually extended like that. It, there, there's, there's a, and then he uses the word intensivity. There's a, a, almost like a singularity to what arises in the moment, which escapes our capacity to utter it, except obliquely. I think then what he means is when there's no when he says well there's there's no past what he means is the sense of past which connects with the notion of time as something which is spatially extended right like other phenomena we have a tendency to talk about time in spatial terms due to our uh, due, due to the, the the toolkit of language that we have this is, and that's okay, but but if we don't, if we're not sensitive to the the, the poesy of that strategy, then you 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 start sort of like tripping into all these errors. It, it, it's a sort of it, uh, with a lot, you know, logical positivists make similar express uh, similar anxieties from a very different from a very different direction. It's kind of an odd juxtaposition there, um, and so perhaps what's going on then is you kind of spiritual. Uh, sorry, in creative evolution, my guess is that he is exceeding to um, using something like spatial language for lack of better language and thus uh, indulging a kind of spatialization which he himself would have would approve in his earlier writing. So the past is real, but it's 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 real in a sense that we have difficulty communicating. That would be my, so to, to, to round it out with regard to the subject object problem, to, it seems to me that for Bergson, it's almost a, a, a problem of expressiveness. It's a linguistic yes. problem. Uh, yeah, he does, he does say at some points that language, you know, is really unfit to capture our inner life and, and we can just gesture because um, as you said, we've developed language in order to deal with external things, uh, the res extensa. And um, this is the big theme of, of his first book, you know, translated under the title Time and Free Will, that our, our true self and our true life is temporal, 
but we spatialize time as soon as we try to picture it, of course, or or conceive of it or talk about it. And that really kills it because in space, things are separable. Um, they're, they're homogeneous. So it's a homogeneous kind of medium in which things can be uh, arbitrarily put in or, or out, as you were saying about the digital experience. Um, whereas time is heterogeneous and so it's it's cumulative you never actually relive the same moment you can never do the same thing twice um and then each part of that cumulative duration uh is essential to it it's one whole swell as i said but even that is a that's a spatial metaphor it's very hard to talk about it without spatializing it right we can talk about a, a stretch of time or a period of time or a length of time that's all spatial And that's why memory becomes important because perhaps memory is that dimension of our experience which brings us closest to encountering the temporal in vivo or in like in its, in its vital significance, right? Memory connects, without memory, there is no sense of duration. There's just, you know, this, 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 this. this memory brings us out of that kind of uh, almost insect, well, apologies to the insects because I don't have access to, you know, bee subjectivity, but, but this sort of more primitive temporality, which is, and I think Nietzsche talks about this, doesn't he, in his um, uh, essay against it's, it's about history yeah we talks about sort of bovine temporality where right right and animals so you, you forget and then they forget that they've forgotten and... yes so right but, yeah, yeah so this is like a bovine temporality which from which we escape these to be memory um but the, the actual experience of memory and this is another actually i was just it's not my thought but i was someone was talking about this the other day the, the digital right we have all it drives me absolutely crazy how people talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that and we're training the machines and all these anthropomorphizing locutions but when you look at our encounter of memory it's not at all like the memory of a machine okay where you know you do not have a, a data file okay which you can then access and then save and, and edit and so forth, right? You have a memory of something that happened to you in your backyard when you were seven years old that will suddenly like arise when you're 63 at a bus station and there's some connection, some point of contact between those two disparate moments in your life. That's how memory works, okay? Quote, unquote, works, right? And, and we cannot escape how it informs our, 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 our present moment. That's, that is not what is going on with the machine, all right? And uh, I really want to emphasize the need to return to how we actually encounter the world because it strikes me that, our, that we have allowed ourselves to become utterly hypnotized by this technological fetish and, and, and then there's this, I'm getting on a soapbox, right? But there's these like these tendencies through roboticization and automation and, and, and not just in crude and obvious ways, like absolutely damaging softwares like chat GPT, so-called language generation softwares and things like that. They're, they're absolutely in my view, just perverse, the extent to which they are going to end up distorting human language. So I'm going back to these earlier figures like Bergson and others, because they have not yet been so thoroughly conditioned by, by these tendencies. And, and um, it's just the, the way they describe reality seems so much more fresh. I, I despair at times of, of people's um, sort of apparent enthrallment to to the to, to this trajectory I, I don't know if you have like any thoughts there or, or responses 
Uh, oh yeah, I'm on that soapbox too. And you know, the I'm the guy with the typewriters in the background. <laughs> um, I mean, this is this is another long, ancient, complicated story that we we tend to. I mean, of course, we we use spatial object, you know, objects and inanimate things to help us keep track of life. If we have to, uh, but then we we tend to to look at those marks and those devices and take them as models for our own self. Um, and you see this as early as, as in, in Plato, a great discussion of this in Plato's Theotetus, where he looks at a couple of models for memory and Socrates lo looks at them and, and rejects them both wisely. But the first one is, okay, we've got this wax block in our heads, right? Uh, like the Greeks had these wax tablets where they would write. Uh, and you can, you stick your signet ring in there, you can make a mark on it and, and you accumulate these marks in your soul, right? And and then depending on how hard or abundant or soft or dirty your wax is, depends how well you'll remember. Uh, and that explains everything, right? Well, no, he shows that it, it doesn't explain how you make certain kinds of mistakes. Um, but I think the deeper point is you're not a wax clock. You're not a thing. You are a mind that understands and has, and has there's meaning for us, there's minding, there's caring, and none of that can happen in a block of wax. And now we have these much more quicker, you know, huge sophisticated blocks of wax like chat GPT. I'm not gonna say it's all pure evil. I mean, it's interesting to play with and potentially useful. I think it's also gonna disrupt our culture in some really bad ways, but, um, but again, we're tempted to analogize that to the human mind, and it's a different being altogether. I agree. Uh, in, I mean, one doesn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but the, I really think it's a question of the relative consciousness wherewith one approaches these uh, instruments as it were um you know when you know how the sausage is made when you know how programs are written and how these things mechanically operate because they're still ultimately mechanical uh as um it becomes far more difficult to be impressed by them they're, they're well what's just, interesting what's interesting about this generative ai is that we don't know how the sausage is made i mean in general we do you know you give it a a mountain of data and you just tell it to find probabilities. But as far as why it came up with the particular response that it did, nobody knows. I mean, the machine doesn't know because it's not conscious of anything. It just does it. We don't know exactly what algorithm it used. We don't know why it spit this out. And so there's a kind of weird mystery there. And then it's tempting to say, well, you know, that this is passing the Turing test now. And maybe what our brain does which is also a mystery right we don't i don't know where thoughts come from um maybe it's just the same thing maybe it's just a black box that's that's finding probabilities it's that's tempting I, that's not my point of view but i understand why people are, are sucked into it right I, I feel that um i've, I've encountered this, this assertion that we really don't know but i'm, I'm not persuaded by it it's it's something like we 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 actually do know in principle it's just yeah. that there's just the, the computers operate at such high speed and with you know parallel processes that interact in in, in different ways at high rates that it, there, there's this noise which obscures the specific pathway that creates the outcome but we could, if you like, zoom in and learn one thing at a time, the way that sort of like neural nets work, as I understand it, is like there's this input and there's the output, which is then subjected to some sort of heuristic to recycle it as an input to try and bring it closer to a certain standard. And essentially, like you said, it's a probability machine that's trying to, you know, that. Uh, sort of, uh, I think it's essentially Bayesian the strategy, which is being deployed by these technologies, if I understand Bayesian probabilities um, sufficiently. Um, 
but it's still fundamentally mechanistic. And uh, the, the, the impression that we don't know derives, I think, simply from the fact that the math in play happens to be, it's that the math in play happens to be probabilistic math, which presumes a certain level of not knowing conjoined with technologies that are um, is operating at very high speeds. Um, so I'm not, it's, it's, it's sort of the thing is that we know in principle, we just don't know in practice because of the, all, you know, the, all the noise involved in the transmission. Uh, of course, maybe yeah. I'm wrong about that. And maybe there is something mysterious. So then like, what's the difference between what's going on with chat GPT and like the human mind? Well, you have, I think the, 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 the relevant differential uh, differentiating criterion is that of meaning. So like the chat GPT right, doesn't know what it's saying. It's just iterating data. And the only reason that data has any significance is because human beings are reading it. I, I agree. It's, it is interesting though that it, it can have significance. I've been playing more with the um, um, AI image generation systems. I think the best one is Midjourney, and the the results are really astoundingly beautiful and intricate often. And, and you're often tempted to say, ah, what does that detail mean? What's going on there? And of course the machine can't answer you. It doesn't mean anything to the machine. So it's an interesting challenge to our whole our ways of interpreting art and beauty and visual representation. And, um, Anyway, maybe we've gotten a little bit off track from Bergson, but, but I'm sure that he, along with Plato and many other great philosophers, would be terribly appalled at what's going on. I mean, I don't know much about, do you know anything about his positions on aesthetic questions? Because this is something else which I think deserves interrogation, like image regeneration, processing, that kind of thing. Um, my suspicion, well, those are two questions, right? Um, so I could bracket my thoughts on image generation for the moment and ask you if uh, there's anything interesting in terms of like uh, Bergson's explicit statements on the aesthetic domain. It may mm. be that his last work might have some clues to that, uh, though I have no familiarity with it in the two sources of uh, religion and morality. Well, I think that was like technically the second to last work, but I haven't really any familiarity with it. I don't know that one either. I don't know much about his views on aesthetics, although a couple of passages come to mind. Um, one is he has some comments on literature that are interesting. And, you know, Proust was actually a cousin of, of Bergson's wife. Uh, and they're the same, you know, French generation. And Proust is, of course, the great explorer of memory who's who's recovering lost time and regaining meaning of his own life through this sort of memory work. Um, so that's very Bergsonian. Uh, and then he has an interesting comment on on dance where um, there's there's a kind of fluidity of a dancer that isn't determined, right? And it can be spontaneous and unpredictable, but it's not random. It's not herky-jerky, you know, now something meaningless happened, but there's a sort of beautiful unfolding of a dance um so that's a nice example of how time itself works for him or at least human time that returns us to you know a sense of the importance of continuity your again yeah. relationship one and the image i mean my understanding with the image software is that most of it all you're really doing is you sort of, it sort of uses the data from the internet to create a, a base, right? A database. And then um, from the manner in which those images are variously presented on the web, it then infers um, what elements should be withdrawn in order to compose the, the, the final image. Which is interesting to the standpoint that there's an interaction of text and image on uh, in the process it, it, 
it's not just an image, it's images which are forged from images which themselves have been characterized by other people. So there's yeah. there. Um, if it didn't have that database and you just asked it to generate something, it would be meaningless. I think uh, it would be incoherent, right? I mean, it, it, it would be just like structurally because of how the software works is my understanding. I mean, I don't have any deep understanding of it, but yes, it depends on textual labels that have been attached by humans to images. Um, now you can feed these these programs just gibberish, you know, uh, random string of characters, and it will produce an image. Um, often a rather disturbing one. <laughs> often it's a face that's exploding or something uh, sort of creepy like that. So it's interesting to play with um, and it can simulate creativity. Like you can say, you know, paint me a Klimt and it'll look at all the paintings of Gustav Klimt and generate something that, wow, it looks like, yeah, that's definitely a Klimt, but it's never existed before. Um, so it it's an intriguing challenge to real creativity. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are people who also take the position that uh, this is very speculative, uh, that there is a kind of latent agency, a ghost in the machine, and uh, some people hypothesize that part of the hazard of our current impasse is that we are invoking entities that really are outside of our human ken, that there is something actually potentially demonic. Uh, it's a, I actually think it's an interesting line of thought. Um, but, you know, we shall see how things continue to unfold. Um, I, this is sort of like from left field or whatnot, but, um, or right field rather, out of right field. Um, so you have this sense of time, which is interesting in Berg's song, but since uh, you're kind of a Heidegger guy, I was wondering if you maybe could like look at the difference between how Heidegger categorizes time and its significance for the human condition and Berg's song. Sure, um, and Heidegger was interested in Berg's song. He mentions him several times in his earlier writings, and he says he's done, he's probably the, gone the farthest of any philosopher in trying to rethink time. So so he admires him, but he says he's ultimately still caught in the, in a tra over traditional idea that that Heidegger traces back to Aristotle actually. Um, it's very intricate, it's an intricate issue um, and it has to do with sorting out the meaning of being. So that's Heidegger's great question. And his thesis in being in time is that time is the horizon for being. So whenever we understand what it means for something to be, we're doing that in the context of temporality. Uh, and that Heidegger would say is, you know, Bergson doesn't get that far because Bergson does raise the question at certain points, you know, well, what do we mean by real? What do we mean by exist? Great question, but he doesn't really systematically tackle it. Uh, and then you can see in that sort of Cartesianism that we were talking about that he's he's assuming certain things that that go way back, like um, in the external physical world, once something is over, once something is in the past, then it no longer exists, right? And so he he you can see in Bergson he's still kind of struggling with this linear model of time, where the the now is like a point on a timeline. And he's trying to get beyond that, of course, at least for the external world. That's how he approaches it. So, so Heidegger wants to rethink all of that. Um, and Heidegger has is a little bit closer to St. Augustine, who begins with puzzles like that, you know, like how can time exist if the past doesn't exist anymore and the future doesn't exist yet and the, the present is just an infinitesimal vanishing next to nothing. Um, but what Augustine ends up saying is, well, time is in the mind. I have a present anticipation of the future and a present recollection of the past and a present awareness of the present. And so the three dimensions of time are really movements of the soul or capacities of the soul. And Heidegger has a similar idea in being in time, except he tries to make it more, more radical. So there's projection of possibilities into the future but it's not necessarily an explicit imagining of what's going to happen. It's just 
we sort of cast ourselves forward into possibilities or we we find ourselves cast forward it happens whether we want it or not and then we're also thrown uh we have a sort of dimension of having been and again that's more radical than a particular act of consciousness like i'm going to remember the day before yesterday you know whether you're actively doing that or not you are thrown and then uh you are present in the in a present world in the Heideggerian sense, which is a kind of context of of meanings. So uh, it's a what he calls an ecstatic concept of temporality, um, meaning you're not a self enclosed sort of atomistic substance. You are standing out. You're ecstatic into future, past, and present, sort of in that order. Because the most important thing is that we are thrust into possibilities. Um, and we have to, we're, sort of, we're faced with the challenge of making someone out of ourselves. You know, who, our being, who we are is always a problem. That's why we're thrust into possibilities. And then we draw on the past as a, this is what we're going to, this is what we have to make something of. And then the present emerges as a kind of interaction of future and past. This is the situation in which we're going to make something of ourselves based on who we've been. There's a later work of Heidegger's, right? Because there's being in time, but then there's a much briefer time and being, right? And is that just a supplement to what he's sketching in being in time, or does he? depart from his initial analysis in some respect in that later yeah he's trying to do something new there and it's very short and sketchy but so that's a lecture from the early 1960s being in time is 1927 and he stopped being in time after publishing two divisions of the first part and then the third division was going to be called time and being and it was going to really show that time is the horizon for being and he never published it much to the frustration of all his fans. And so when he gave a lecture called Time and Being, people were quite excited. But no, it's an attempt to, to rethink things. And it, and it gets at this concept from his late philosophy called uh, Ereignis, or the event of appropriation, which is not in being and time. So uh, it, it's a separate piece. Um, there's a seminar he gave about that talk, which is published together with it, which is maybe a little more helpful than the talk itself. Well, I don't want to spin off too much, but what is this notion of appropriation or erogenous? Um, I mean, just as a sort of play on words, in German, when you say there is such and such, you say es gibt, meaning literally it gives, right? Um, so it gives time, it gives being, there's time, there's being. What's the it that gives them? Well, the it is the erogenous, which normally means just event. Um, and it's a word that Heidegger was starting to use in the starting in the mid 1930s, um, and then he slowly dribbles it into his public texts. Um, it's not an ordinary event for sure, and some interpreters say, "Well, it's not really an event at all." But then my question is, "Well, why did he pick that word?" So he did pick the word "eigenes." Um, it it echoes the word "eigen," which means own or proper. So this is why some people translated it as the event of appropriation or the event of owning or an owning basically in my reading it's it is a happening but it's a very radical sort of happening that brings us into our own and to be in your own is to is a problem for heidegger it's that you have this question of who are you and who are we and your being has become a problem for you so whatever it is um that jolts us out of just being an identical thing and makes us a problem for ourselves, uh, that in, in my reading is uh, eragnes. And that's the, the birth of a, a world and an age and a, a sphere of meaning. Is this then, I imagine, connected to authenticity in Heidegger? Is that what? He, he stops using that word, but there, I mean, it's. The word eigen, own, is also part of the word eigentlichkeit, authenticity. You know, it means owning up to who you are and, and becoming your own. 
um, taking possession of your life. And there's that there's that issue in time that I was talking about before that time seems to be the medium in which we lose ourselves and are dispersed and, and scattered. And there's always this challenge of remembering yourself and, and pulling yourself back together. So, so authenticity is, is what does that in being in time. And then in the Aragnus texts, um, you know, there's still something for us to do as individuals. We sort of should um, live up to the challenge of Aragnus, but Aragnus is not something that we do. It's more, it's a happening that's more, that's prior to anything we can actively do. So it's this mysterious um, gift or event. Is it his effort maybe about to insert something like grace into his world? Maybe? Yeah, I mean, he would quickly deny that, that this is theology and that Eragnus or being refers to God, but, but some of it does look like pretty theological language. So going back to Bergson, I, I, what you're sketching there seems very similar to stuff he says in his first major work, Time, right? And um, Free Will, where uh, freedom is realized in this space of the intensive as opposed to the extensive. So there's just sort of more primordial domain. So that might be sort of where you can, I don't know might be too much as speculative to say that Heidegger is inspired in some way by uh, well they're not I'm they're not saying the same thing but they're dealing with the same problem um here's a book on my bookshelf waiting to be read by Christophe Bouton Time and Freedom uh this which was published um was published in French uh in 2008 so it's pretty recent but he, he talks a lot about both Bergson and Heidegger. So I'm looking forward to reading this. Um, I think there's more in, in being in time, in early Heidegger, there's more of an element of decision and choice than there is in Bergson. Um, because Bergson is all about freedom, but he's not all about choice. I think he says choice is fairly superficial. So um, freedom is when all that you've been and uh, all the entire movement of your past sort of surges spontaneously into the future. Um, there isn't a moment where you sort of stand back and look at different options and say, hmm, I think I'll pick A. That's a very superficial kind of freedom for him. It's you know the, the deep questions, he's the deep issues he's interested in that... Um, the deep acts of freedom, let me put it, put it that way, are they're the unique, unpredictable, but not random result of the accumulation of your past. Um, and there's also a kind of, I don't like the word irrationalism, but it, it's a non-rationalist uh, understanding of action there. You know, he says, sometimes the best reason is no reason at all, where you do something and it's just what you had to do, given the unique person that you have been and are, and you can't justify it in terms of abstract principles. Heidegger isn't talking about abstract principles either, but he is interested in, in kind of getting some distance from who you've been and everything else and making a choice. I'm probably more sympathetic with Bergson. It might be a difference of emphasis rather than substance. It's almost sort of interior, but more primordial than rationality. Rationality is sort of so late to the conversation of our life. Uh, we really overplay it. Uh, it also like a question of like who we are, like a question of like knowing who I am is more difficult than I think I initially thought that it was and uh and genuine freedom is going to well up from who i actually am who you actually are and who and what we are <laughs> more it, it the the wellspring of our being is, is i think deep in a way which exceeds 
the grasp of the rational, right? It might reach there, but I don't think you can ever grasp it. And I think that that, that which may be why trying to demonstrate free will is such a so to provide the, the, such a source of consternation for, for people is that you're trying to work with something from a different universe. And that's uh, why you can't really demonstrate that we're free or unfree or why those sorts of conversations tend to have a almost grating circularity to them. I really like that phrase of yours, like the deep acts of freedom. Um, and anyway, I think there's there's much hope to be derived from from realizing that deep acts of freedom. It comes from like a more expansive, more expansive sense of what's happening. Yeah, I mean we we do have reason. We can reason with each other, but but we tend to think of reason in a very narrow sense. And if you go back to the Greek word logos, which translates translates as reason, usually Heidegger has an interesting analysis of that word and in, in introduction to metaphysics he, he says well the the verb from which it comes basically means to gather together to sort of glean and select and gather so logos he translates as gathering gatheredness mm -hmm. uh that at least sounds deeper than just you know oh let's figure it all out logically um there's a certain there's a deep kind of meaning making and and at least attempt at integrity but we're never going to understand ourselves in full. There, there, there are two um, fragments of Heraclitus on Logos that I like to try to think about together. One is, uh, they're about Logos and the Psyche. So one is um, the, the Psyche, the soul, is a Logos that increases itself. And the other is, um, you will never get to the bottom of the Psyche no matter how far you go, that's the gist of it. And if you put those together, I think uh, one direction you could go is to say, well, a certain amount of self-awareness is possible. You're applying this gathering to yourself and grasping something about yourself. But as you do that, you enlarge yourself. You open up a whole new dimension and a new level of darkness, which you're challenged to understand, right? And if you understand that, then there's always gonna be a further complexity that you've generated and that escapes you. And so you're never going to get to the bottom of yourself. Well, that may well be the élan vital, right? Yeah. That, that, that life itself is always expanding and deepening, expanding and deepening. That's, that's good stuff. And it does, I think, there someone would be sympathetic to how I just put it, because in creative evolution, he says, well, consciousness is itself an effect of this cosmic um, process, uh, not just an effect, of course, a very important effect, but it means that consciousness is never going to fully understand the whole of which it is a part. You know, we can, we can kind of gesture toward it and get a sense of it, but um, ultimately you have to live. You can't, just try to reduce life to reason and concepts. And then this, I guess, almost brings up the question to, uh, the question of, of the corollary, which is death. And where does death fit into this, into this framework, right? Mm -hmm. So Heidegger had a lot to say about that um, as a conditioning term. Uh, we can wrap it up here shortly because i know we've been talking for a bit i don't want to hold on to you no problem but um i think it might be fruitful to, to look at that for a little bit this question of death and i don't know that bergson actually says much about death um but uh and in part this is me being sort of selfish um because the question of death has well it's always there right but but there have been uh, conversations lately which sort of bring it back around as, as more uh, important. I was, I've been discussing I mean, this debate with this other um, friend of mine who thinks that death can be uh, eliminated 
Uh, it's not a caricature of his position. It's his position. Um, and he's not. He's not a crazy person. It's it's a it's a position that people hold that, that death is uh, just an, a feature of uh, imperfect biology that can be uh, we can engineer our way out of it and trying to communicate how problematic it will be to eliminate death from life in a deep way and maybe the thoughts of Heidegger might be useful in that connection. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I just checked the index to creative evolution, and there's only one mention of death outside a note. And it's interesting. He says, the animal takes its stand on the plant, man bestrides animality, and the whole of humanity in space and in time is one immense army galloping beside and before and behind each of us in an overwhelming charge, able to beat down every resistance and clear the most formidable obstacles, perhaps even death. So um, he's, he's not a sort of techno post-humanist like your friend sounds to, like he is, but Bergson, you know, I mean, a whole book on life and he mentions death only once uh, in a, suggesting that, yeah, maybe we can get rid of it. So he's very much focused on, on vitality. Heidegger though is sometimes seen as morbid in being in time because he has a whole chapter on being towards death. Um, I think Heidegger is, when he says death, he really means mortality. In other words, the capacity to die, the capacity to, to be faced with the impossibility of existing. And he says that needs to be distinguished from the question of demise, which is um, when a human being's body stops functioning and you know they become a corpse. That's a different issue, actually. Um, and he even says that he's not taking, an is taking a stand on whether an afterlife is possible. But he does say that we're always being towards death. So this sounds a little paradoxical. Um, I think it makes sense, though. So even if we, you know, get rid of the telomeres in our cells or whatever, and we become functionally immortal, or even if we all go to heaven and, you know, we're admitted to the presence of God forever, as long as we're still recognizably human, we will be faced with this possibility of not existing. I mean, we don't become necessary beings. Uh, and that possibility is there at every moment. Um, but we we don't like to think about that. We dismiss that. We say that's that's morbid and that's macabre and so on. And let's not focus on those depressing things. But Heidegger is making the really pretty simple point, I think, that you know, it's very salutary to be aware that you're mortal. Um, it gets you to stop wasting time. It gets you to snap out of it and and come to grips with who you are taking yourself to be you know if your life were going to end right now what would all what would it all amount to um so we're always being towards death in the sense that we have this orientation towards our possible non-existence even though the orientation is usually evasive denial and um inauthentic self-deception You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, 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 it just strikes me that without a being toward death, there's no deep act of freedom, right? Or there's, there's no, like if, or if the psyche, for the psyche to deepen its sense of self and gather, it seems that something has to be released. And to me, that that is that is what is happening with death, and I suspect that Heidegger is in the same neighborhood. When and I do grasp the distinction he's making between being towards death and near demise, right? Because you can completely destroy your identity and become a different person while you're alive, right? But sometimes in a very destructive way. It's one uh, way of dealing it the, the example i cite there i think is a bad faith way of, of dealing with it right but that possibility conditions what's constructively potential so if we just try and vacate that dimension of our being i think we really diminish ourselves but when you uh, say we have to release something um 
say more about that. I think so uh, in order, in order yeah, to, like yeah. humility, right? There's like this humility, which is is a, is a first notion that comes to mind when you question me on that. Like, what do you mean by releasing? What I, it's um, it's it's there's a chase in it. As I've learned and as I've grown, I've inevitably had to realize certain things that I held, even with profound conviction. Um, have been I've had to let go of that conviction and realize that uh, life is more complicated than, than than what was implied by those earlier holdings. And there's like a, a profound destabilization which accompanies this process of growth. Because if I had if I was so certain about those things, and then if I actually now realize that those things about which I were so certain were not in fact so certain, then what can I be even certain now? And it, you find yourself at the threshold where you see how nihilism can be a kind of temptation. But uh, um, then this is where something like faith enters into the equation, the faith that despite realizing that your convictions are always merely probable, they still are moving towards something coherent, something like a, a truth, however evasive that truth may be. Uh, well, that, that you have to have faith that this process works out. I mean, you don't have to, you can renounce that faith, but I don't think that that leads anywhere good. Um, so letting go, what do I mean by letting go? I mean, letting go of the sense that you had it all figured out, which may sound kind of jejune or sophomoric, um, uh, and almost like a trite and obvious thing to say. No, but, no. Uh, experientially, this this is what I mean, and it's just like one surrender after another. Um, and I don't mean surrender there in a, in, a, in in a pejorative in a pejorative sense. Um, mm -hmm. And then other things start to emerge, which uh, it's not just what you have to let go, it's also what you have to learn to embrace. There are things that I have wanted to reject in certain phases of my life, which now with the passage of time, I realize are like a, like family, for example, for I have a sort of very mixed relationship with the ideal of the familial and family but as I've grown older, I've realized that entering into the familial as a crucial aspect of my life, a family, is actually quite important to this whole gig of being human. Um, and it's a very conservative sounding assertion uh, politically in this climate. Uh, but to me, it's something which has arisen as I've become, in a sense, more radical. So that 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 would be my response. I don't know if that makes sense. It, it does. It does. Um, I mean, having a family is one of the most radical parts of our thrownness, of our indebtedness. Um, you know, Heidegger, as he aged, sort of moved in a similar direction to what you're describing, because after being in time, of course, he, in the 30s, he becomes a national socialist and is all um, enthusiastic for a while about revolution and the founding of a new state for the people and all this uh, nationalistic uh, propaganda. And then he, he gradually comes to see that it's propaganda. And by the end of the war, he is talking about Gelassenheit, a sort of releasement or, or letting be, letting truth and openness happen instead of trying to force it. So I think he, you know, he never really came to grips with his own guilt, but he he tried, and maybe made a little more progress than than some people. Um, and another thing that occurred to me as you were speaking was um, Hegel's famous master-slave dialectic, where the slave, you know, he he's it's this ironic story where the 
the master who seems to be calling all the shots is really very dependent on the slave and has this false consciousness and the slave horrible as his life is does have certain advantages and one of them is that he's really faced with the threat of death i mean the slave knows that yeah this other guy has the power to kill me at any moment for for on a whim right and so you if you feel that you hegel says your your entire self has been shaken and nothing has remained stable there's nothing you can hold on to there's no hope there's no solid refuge and that is actually sort of liberating i mean that's when you just discover you know as as we were saying before we tend to externalize right we tend to identify ourselves with things we own or or things we know outside us or things we use and none of that can stand when you're really faced with the reality of your mortality you're thrown back on yourself and so it can be a salutary moment I think that might be a good place to leave off, at least for now. Um, thank you so much for, for being on. So uh, Yeah, thanks for a good conversation. So uh, what was that book uh, that you showed, uh, the 2008 book? It's called it? Time and Freedom by Christophe Bouton, B-O-U-T-O-N. I'm going to have to look him up, so... Um, yep, got to get around to this. <laughs> so, only so much time, right? <laughs> so, I know we never know how much. So, all right. all right, talk to you again soon. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye bye.